Now we move on to the last session of the day. This is an important discussion on the impact of COVID-19 lockdowns and all on HIV AIDS service delivery in Philippines and in Pakistan. This will be moderated by Dr. Farah Hussain, Deputy Cell Manager for MSF Tokyo in Japan. She will be speaking to Dr. Arshad Altaf, who is a consultant with the WHO, and Dr. Kate Ler Leritana, founding medical director of Sustained Health Initiatives of the Philippines. Now I hand over to Dr. Farah Hussain. Hello, guys. Hi, how are you? Uh, thank you for joining wherever you are in this session. Um, uh, basically, we are talking about the impact of COVID-19 on the services, HIV care related services. And in this session, we are talking about two contexts, Pakistan and Philippines. We have two great speakers. I was going to quote to start with uh, a global fund survey where I was going to talk about the antenatal care visits, how they fall by 66% in seven of the countries that were surveyed uh, in this uh, research. But then, of course, we saw in the last presentation how the impact of uh, COVID-19 was also in Bangladesh on the antenatal care services. There is no denial of the fact that till now, COVID-19 pandemic impacted the world beyond imagination. 115 million people are going to be under extreme poverty from this disease. And as countries have gone into lockdown, gender-based violence has increased, unemployment has soared, and access to healthcare for the poorest and most vulnerable has been cut. COVID-19, as we heard also before at the beginning of the session, has made people less likely to seek healthcare because, of course, people are afraid of getting infected from the virus. They're not going to the health facilities. Fear and uncertainty surrounding the COVID-19 disease have also increased stigma and discrimination. The pandemic, to be honest, has created a perfect storm of economic health and social crisis and threatens to reverse all these extraordinary gains that we have made in the field of HIV, TB, and malaria services. For instance, healthcare workers having to shift their focus to COVID-19, the lockdowns imposed and the transport restrictions, um, and of course, government spending more resources, more and more on COVID-19. According to uh, our data also, yesterday we heard that the TB diagnosis have fallen in India by 25%. In the Cambodia mission in our project, the hep C diagnosis have fallen even below 60%. Um, and of course, all these disruptions continue to threaten the progress that have been made so far in the crucial HIV services, including prevention and access to treatment and testing. If people cannot know their HIV status or access treatment and the incidence rate of HIV in the countries already overwhelmed health system are going to be in risk of increasing. In this session, we are basing our discussion on two contexts, as I said before, in Asia, namely Philippines and Pakistan. Uh, the presenters are also going to give us an idea of the existing challenges for accessing HIV services for the population in these two contexts. Today, we have two great speakers, Dr. Kate Leritana, who speaks about the geographical and technological challenges of HIV service during COVID-19 lockdown in Philippines. And Dr. Arshad Altaf takes us through the impact of COVID-19 on HIV services in the context of Pakistan, along with the pre-existing challenges. Dr. Kate, uh, to introduce her, she has completed her clinical and research fellowship in infectious diseases from UPPGH and was the recipient of the Clement S. Getmintan Award, Kate, if I'm pronouncing it wrong, sorry for that, for the most outstanding fellow in research. She is also the founding medical director of Sustained Health Initiatives of the Philippines, a nonprofit organization that aims to bridge the gaps in HIV healthcare in Philippines through capacity building, linkage to care, innovation, and advocacy. She's a HIV physician who has dedicated her work to improve HIV care while also lending a hand in HIV research programs and policy development. She's the medical director and HIV core team leader of SHIP Clinic, a standalone HIV primary care clinic that focuses on uh, 
the care of people living with HIV and sexual health. Her clinical and research interests revolve around HIV and health of men having sex with men. And our second speaker, Dr. Ashad Altaf, is a medical doctor and a public health professional currently working as a technical officer in the Science Information and Dissemination Department of WHO Regional Office for the Eastern Mediterranean region in Cairo, Egypt. For almost two decades, he has been involved in HIV and AIDS prevention related service care, policy and guideline development and country support. He works closely with key population, including sex workers and drug users. Prior to this assignment, he was providing HIV technical assistance in eight countries in the Asia Pacific region. He has over two dozen publications and peer reviewed journals highlighting key HIV issues. But we start with Dr. Kate. Dr. Kate, uh, please start with the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Farah, and thank you for having me uh, in your conference. I'd like to thank you for giving me the space to share our experiences. Uh, will you be sharing my slides? Aditi? Aditi? Yes. Thank you so much. All right, so I come from the Philippines, a unique archipelago of 2,000 livable islands in yet a weak internet connection, which presents us challenges to life in general, but let me tell you more. Four years ago, we were um, given the fastest growing numbers of new cases of HIV in the Philippines. And two years after that, we now have the fastest growing numbers of new HIV diagnosis in the world. We saw a 203% increase in cases um, compared to 2010. So from a 1,500 a year to now 12,000 new cases a year. Aside from that, the new cases being diagnosed are younger and younger as time passes. 80% of our new cases are from the young population with a median age of diagnosis of 28 years old. Another unfortunate fact is that despite our HIV medications being provided by for free, only 61% of the population are documented to be on antiretrovirals. 39% are either alive yet not on ART and are lost to follow up, migrated out of the country, and we are just hoping that they are seeking treatment elsewhere or have expired and are unreported. Now, UNAIDS in 2016 challenged every country in the world to achieve 90-90-90 by 2020, last year. This meant that 90% of PLHIV should know their status through taking the HIV test, and that 90% of those who are diagnosed should be on ART. Of those on ART, 90% should be virally suppressed or undetectable. However, our scores by the end of 2020 was 68, 61, and 94. Although I should mention that not all PLHIV in the Philippines have done a viral load due to lack of access to this test. Only 17% have. Of the 17%, 94% are undetectable. In March of 2020 came the COVID pandemic and then our lockdown. Uh, we were dealt with a major blow that could have the potential to unravel all the gains from the past decade. Next slide, please. To determine the effect of COVID-19 on the disruption of HIV services, the Asian COVID survey was launched in October in 10 countries in Asia, such as India, Hong Kong, Japan, Malaysia, Singapore, South Korea, Taiwan, Thailand, Vietnam, and the Philippines. It was a 10-minute quantitative online survey intended for PLHIV key affected populations at risk for HIV and prescribers. The survey was sponsored by Gilead Sciences. The purpose of having the survey was to assess the status of HIV service delivery during COVID in Asia and to identify the gaps in the hopes of encouraging discussions among stakeholders to address the barriers and limitations. The survey was created with the objectives of identifying how COVID impacted HIV and key affected population with regards to access, 
to medicine, healthcare, sexual behavior, stigma and discrimination, and to identify how it affected clinic time with patients, access to preventive care, testing, and use of telehealth. There were five main messages resulting from this survey. First, that there was a disruption in HIV care. Second, there was interruption in ART delivery. Third, decreased access to HIV-related testing. Fourth, a heavy impact was seen on preventative HIV care. And last, there was a shift to telemedicine and remote refilling of medications. Now, locally, the Joint United Nations Program on HIV-AIDS or UNAIDS and the United Nations Development Program or UNDP conducted a survey among 241 people living with HIV in a rapid assessment of the impact of COVID on the national HIV response. Next slide, please. This survey revealed that the lockdown and standstill of transportation posed a big problem, and the Filipino PLHIV's concerns centered on access to medication. Majority of the concerns are complaints about transportation and delivery, distance to their treatment facilities, presence of checkpoints and crossing borders, and stock availability. Next slide, please. The Asian survey revealed that 51% of physicians experience disruption of HIV care in terms of frequency of visit and patient load. 15% of respondents said that visits were delayed or rescheduled due to closure of the clinic or themselves not being able to report to the hospital. Aside from this, there was a significant 74% decrease in PLHIVs seen at the clinic due to travel constraints and concerns of contracting COVID-19. A few PLHIV responders, about 8%, reported treatment interruption. However, 82% were concerned about long-term access to ART. Among those who were HIV negative, 63% were concerned about access to PrEP. Next slide, please. HIV testing in the Philippines is accomplished within the facility and by outreach workers using community-based screening, which utilizes the rapid test, which has been very helpful in increasing our reach in HIV testing, not only because it yields results in less than five minutes, but also the patient does not need to go to the facility. By the end of 2020, there was a massive 61% decrease in tests compared to the previous year. We still do not make use widely of our HIV self-testing. Next slide, please. Next, please. Decrease in testing produced a concurrent 37% decrease in new HIV diagnosis. Next slide. Sorry, previous slide, please. Added to the lack of testing, the lack of counselors who would usually personally accompany patients to the clinics contributed to a 28% decrease in newly enrolled patients. Referrals are critical for helping to prevent HIV transmissions in the community at large. And so this disruption could result in people being unknowingly infected and HIV-positive patients not accessing the treatment they need, leading to further health issues or ongoing transmission. Next slide, please. The treatment gap is a difference that exists between the number of people who need care and those who actually receive it. The HIV treatment gap increased to 90% after COVID. Next slide, please. Our local health ministry reported that almost half of HIV clinics experienced critical to no ART supply during the early part of the lockdown. Only 45% of HIV clinics had complete stocks. So to address limitations, outreach work was shifted 
to online dating apps such as Grindr, Planet Romeo, and Hornet, and social media apps such as Facebook and Twitter. ART access was facilitated by a volunteer-driven home delivery program that eventually included remote refilling through HIV clinics. Next slide, please. The lack of mobility was such a problem that our local health ministry estimated that it would take PLHIVs living in geographically isolated and disadvantaged areas about 21 hours on foot at most to reach the nearest treatment facility. This problem was much more acute for clients residing in uh, illustrated areas. Next slide, please. Personal visits also shifted to online consultations, whether via video calls, phone calls, chatting, and even texting. Adoption of telehealth and remote refill of ART was higher in the Philippines compared to other countries. Among prescribers, 82% expected an increase in the adoption of telehealth services in the future. So even at our currently weak internet speeds, the Philippines has the potential to be early adopters of e-health. In conclusion, the COVID-19 pandemic and travel restrictions greatly affected the HIV services in the Philippines. The surveys showed that there is an urgent need to provide services without disruption in the face of geographical and technological barriers and to discover innovative solutions to continually reach the people for testing and treatment. It is therefore recommended that our country improve its telehealth infrastructure and for us to create a national disaster or epidemic response plan for continued HIV services during similar, similar emergencies in the future. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Dr. Kate. Numbers speak volumes, right? There was a 61% decrease in testing and 28% decrease in new enrollment. Okay, I'm sure we'll have more questions after, but we start with Dr. Arshad. If you can carry on with your presentation, please. Thank you, sure can. Uh, should I project myself, uh, colleagues, or somebody from your end can do it? I think it's being managed. Okay, good, cool, thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much uh, once again, and uh, I appreciate uh, the reaching out uh, for this special event. Uh, colleagues at MSF, uh, I'm really grateful uh, for giving me this opportunity to provide you a quick overview of the challenges that Pakistan, as far as I said, is facing in terms of HIV AIDS service delivery as well as the impact of uh, the corona pandemic uh, on HIV services. May I have the next slide, please, Akanash? Like I said, thank you to MSF. And uh, I also would like to acknowledge the recent, uh, well, as recent as they are available numbers and data related to HIV services and COVID-19 from the WHO country of in Pakistan. Next, please. Uh, Pakistan, uh, like, Many other countries uh, is one of the unfortunate ones where the epidemic is uh, growing very rapidly. And uh, previously, the driver was only one key population group, which was the uh, people who inject drugs. But now, uh, TGs, uh, transgender sex workers, and uh, female sex workers, uh, the prevalence is uh, on the rise in those two groups as well, which was expected if you have fragmented services. Uh, in 2019, April, there was a devastating HIV outbreak among children and women in a remote region of Pakistan, and uh, more than 1,000 children were HIV infected, uh, and a modest number of uh, mothers were also infected, uh, but their fathers were not infected, and uh, the main inference that was uh, linked or main association that was found with the outbreak was uh, poor uh, infection prevention and control practices or practices of some of the healthcare providers and the role of uh, unsafe therapeutic injections and uh, unsafe IV drips among uh, women and children who were affectees of the outbreak. 
Unfortunately, HIV preventive services uh, stand at a very low scale, less than 20%, even less, I think. And uh, the coverage is, uh, this low coverage is now showing the result that the epidemic is increasing and trickling down to low risk population as well. Uh, unfortunately, another unfortunate is that uh, there is still, as when we started working in HIV AIDS in the early 2000s, we used to address the stigma and discrimination issues a lot. And we had hoped that uh, many of those issues would have been addressed by now, but unfortunately they still stand and they, are have, they continue to uh, impact negatively some of the HIV prevention services, including uh, treatment services by key population groups, especially transgender persons. Uh, although uh, the country has money for the HIV response, but it is not uh, very well organized and dispersed properly. As a result of which uh, the HIV response right now is largely donor dependent and only one key donor is providing services uh, or supporting services, which is the global fund. And uh, the outbreak, it has almost been two years uh, uh, since the HIV outbreak in this small town in Pakistan. And we had hoped that uh, HIV will get the needed attention and things will, will improve. Unfortunately, they have not. Next slide, please. So in terms of numbers, uh, Pakistan is a country of over 200 million people. And this number on your left of the screen, which shows 0 0.24, which means there are 240,000 estimated HIV positive persons. This was, this used to hover around less than 200,000, but it is now on the rise. And the red box on your screen shows uh, the, the number of persons who are on treatment, which is obviously quite low, very low as a matter of fact. And uh, uh, this is another unfortunate part that, uh, that I'll continue to talk about it in the next slide. So we have the next slide, please. Uh, see, the, this is a little bit old data, but just to give you an idea of people who have HIV and who are on ART street, like Philippines, ARTs are also free in Pakistan. But the issue is that HIV testing numbers are so low, the outreach to key population persons, the outreach to identify PL HIV is so low that the number of persons on ARTs is, is, remain very low. So 13% are only uh, receiving uh, ART coverage which is an abysmal number and uh, it does not help in uh, reducing the impact of the infection. Next slide, please. Coming on to the coronavirus virus pandemic, uh, there are two columns on this table. On the left of your screen is showing the service and on the right is showing the status. So a green check and a cross means partial services, a green check complete means full services, and a full red check across is completely disrupted services. So. As a result of the pandemic, the first uh, two phase uh, waves uh, and the lockdown and et cetera, there was obviously an impact on harm reduction services for PWIDs, including services, uh, uh, whatever programs that were providing services to MSM and DGs, their services were also halted or delayed, especially the distribution of uh, condoms and lubricants. Uh, similar uh, for PrEP and uh, or for outreach as well. So, however, HIV testing for KPs continued, but uh, I have to take this one with a pinch of salt that these were mostly facility-based. So if somebody could go to the testing center or the treatment center, they could have been tested. Whereas in normal circumstances, there are community outreach workers who go out in the community to TGs, MSM, et cetera, counsel them, educate them, and offer them rapid testing. So the first test is, is conducted in the field, in an area, or either in a vehicle. And in case of a reactive test, the person is transported or referred to the testing center for further testing. So uh, the HIV testing services were continu continued, uh, facility-based in particular, and ART services also continued. Viral load testing remained the challenge. From the very beginning, it has been a challenge. It was partially disrupted during the pandemic. And it still presents a challenge because uh, of uh, the issues of availability of the logistics that is required at the treatment center. And unfortunately, many a times the people who have to initiate ARTs and they are asked to go for viral testing from private labs. And, and it, it is a huge out-of-pocket expense uh, on some of the key population persons who have especially very low income. Next slide, please. 
uh, like uh, Kate mentioned, there was obviously similar kind of disruption uh, linkage to care in East Asia of ART. If you focus on the left side of this busy slide, just focus on a couple of things. 70% drop in initiation on ARTs. And then if you see the red color that after being linked, uh, total of 3,168 3, PLHIV, we lost a lot of them because of the pandemic uh, in, the, in 2020. Next slide, please. Some of the factors for your information, which are uh, impacting and resulting in this uh, modest coverage of HIV testing and treatment. Uh, coverage because of lack of the domestic uh, funding, funding available at provincial and national level. And uh, many of the funds that are allocated at the national level and, and sub-national level, they are not utilized properly. Uh, there is uh, obviously low quality of program of coverage. Like I said in my earlier slide, the poor coverage. So when there is not enough coverage, uh, that means that you're missing a lot of person in terms of testing, education, et cetera, et cetera, condom delivery, uh, harm reduction services. So the, the epidemic is bound to only go upwards. And some of the unresolved issues, which many countries face, including Pakistan, are you know, the long travel distances they have to travel to ART centers. Uh, like I mentioned, baseline investigation is an issue. And, Many of the ART centers, they close at 2 p.m. unfortunately, and as a result of which uh, key population persons uh, miss uh, or do not, uh, unable to get there on time. And if it is crowded center, they still close, start closing at 1.30, 1.45, and many people are missed and could not, or unable to get services. Next slide, please. So there was some contingency planning to, as a result to address the issues of pandemic. Uh, Ministry of Health, along with WHO and other partners. Some of the measures that were put in place uh, to provide services or continue services included, they started giving uh, multi-month dispensing of ARTs. Uh, in the, after the first wave, the doorstep delivery and use of four-year services were also initiated. There is an association in Pakistan, APLHIV Association. They played a critical role in this uh, distribution of ARTs at doorstep because they are in contact with these people, provide, they provided addresses and et cetera, mobile numbers. So as a result of reaching out through WhatsApp groups and et cetera, uh, addresses were acquired and courier services were initiated to provide ARTs. And uh, fortunately, adult ARTs never have been an issue except their pediatric formulations as a result of the Rathodira outbreak have had challenges. Next slide, please. So uh, I think I have covered this, that search and rescue of uh, from different angles. Uh, so we can skip this. Let's, next slide, please. So concluding, the epidemic is escalating and uh, HIV uh, response has to be, the country has to own the response in order to improve the services. Uh, Obviously, like the whole world, like as Farah and Kate mentioned, the epidemic, the pandemic has impacted the HIV response significantly, and which has resulted in the decreased HIV testing and treatment coverage. Uh, there are issues of, from the very beginning and still remain the data management issues are still there. Next slide, please. Uh, so I was just looking into some of the material for the, the slides, and this is from this month. Uh, interestingly, this is from Reuters, and the first paragraph is about a trans person who's saying that my friend told me I may get sick since HIV, since I am HIV positive, and uh, her first, her friend was telling her not to get the corona vaccine. However, the second paragraph mentions uh, the well, she comments the TG person that uh, she stood up in the line that was dedicated to for females, but she was intimidated to stand in that line, uh, fearing that how will the other women react to her that she's standing as a TG person in a female line, highlighting the issues of stigma and discrimination and et cetera, et cetera. I stop here, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Arshad. Of course, to begin with, the ART coverage was low in Pakistan than in COVID, 70% lower than that. Uh, yeah. Okay, we start with our question uh, and answer session. We start with uh, Kate. Uh, Kate, there's a question for you. 
asking, what do you think are the main reasons driving the hugely increasing numbers of HIV in Philippines? And what are the barriers to testing and acceptability of treatment to this population? Thank you for the question. Uh, the reasons uh, are multifactorial. It, it's still behavior, rooted in behavior. Um, also lack of access to preventative uh, measures. Um, we do have condoms and lubes, that, which is given free by the government, uh, but as expected, along with our ART supplies, it was not readily available to everybody. Um, and I'm just talking about the lockdown. Uh, PrEP has just recently been provided for free by our uh, uh, funding partners, but for a long while, it was uh, out of pocket. And PrEP is such an important aspect of HIV prevention. And if it is not available to the majority, then it's not really going to be effective. We just started giving PrEP for free this year. So we are hoping that it can actually make a dent in our current situation. We will um, update on, on our new cases um, in the future. May I ask what the second question was? Yeah, it's asking what are the barriers to testing and acceptability of treatment in this population? Right. So the majority of our HIV cases are um, men who have sex with men, um, followed by um, uh, partners of men who have sex with men, and uh, a very small um, percentage who, of, of people who inject drugs. Uh, we also have um, a, a lower than previous uh, sector population who uh, uh, work in sex, uh, uh, are sex workers. But um, we haven't really um, expanded our self-testing modality. It is currently still under a, uh, an operational trial. We are hoping that we will be able to provide free HIV self-testing. Um, we think that one of the barriers to this is stigma, um, self-stigma and societal stigma. People are afraid to go to designated testing centers. That's why our community-based screening is actually uh, more um, applicable for the Philippines because peer-led services, peer-driven services have been uh, seen to be more acceptable to our key affected population. So if the person who is going to test them is someone who they can relate to, it is more acceptable for them. But this entails that tests are done outside the facility and therefore it was really affected by the pandemic because of our lack of mobility. There was another question just related to that because uh, the question was that, could you please elaborate why there was lower self-testing of HIV? How reliable is the test? Yeah, so um, the, 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 we still have no policy for HIV self-testing. After our operational studies are completed and uh, we present robust data to the uh, local health ministry, this is when we can create policies for that. And after policies have been created, then the test will be widely accessible to everyone. And the government can purchase this um, and provide it for free. Okay, thank you. Um, of course, we hear about stigma in Philippines and uh, also in Pakistan. Uh, there is a question, uh, Dr. Altaf. Um, what is WHO uh, doing in terms of awareness raising and, of course, patient confidentiality, keeping patients' dignity intact? And in order to increase the patient enrollment and treatment, I guess that's a big barrier, the stigma, right? So, uh, because you're from WHO, so what, what are you guys doing and what is your stand? WHO, just to clarify that disclaimer, is uh, not a regulatory body, all right? It is uh, the country, the national and the provincial programs, uh, as well as uh, 
other stakeholders, but WHO works hand in hand with them very closely. The only organization in the world which is an intergovernmental organization because we sit closely within the ministry. Sometimes in the ministry we sit. Anyway, so uh, uh, and advocacy is primarily the mandate of UNAIDS, which has been working very hard in Pakistan in uh, issuing uh, in addressing some of these issues. However. Uh, like I said, when the HIV epidemic started and Pakistan in Pakistan, early 2000, the response started to come in. The main issue was uh, obviously Muslim country, conservative country, uh, issues of stigma and discrimination were very, very high. It was considered as the disease of the MSM uh, or gay men only. And uh, there was so much aversion towards it. It started, it was addressed with hard work almost uh, decade was spent on this and it, many challenges were overcome. But in the past five years, unfortunately, because of the poor response as a result of whatever the priority, shifting of priorities uh, of the government because uh, HIV was, uh, HIV never was on the radar of the government in Pakistan. We have huge burden of TB, we have huge burden of malaria, we have huge burden of infant mortality and uh, maternal mortality and et cetera, et cetera. Then everything in the recent five years has been engulfed by polio. So as a result of that, HIV response uh, came, came very low, low down in the radar. However, uh, uh, it was addressed again and again by UNAIDS and WHO, and WHO took a lead role in addressing some of these issues, uh, working closely with the national and the provincial AIDS control program, as well as the community-based organizations. There are events organized to, to work closely with the media, both print and uh, electronic media. Uh, there are events organized uh, for outreach workers to deal effectively with the stigma and discrimination that key population persons face training, not only uh, events, but trainings as well. But uh, it seems that uh, it still remains a huge, uh, a huge area still needs to be covered and it still requires a lot of effort. Like I was saying in my presentation, that the stigma and discrimination, these key population first and especially TGs, they still face so much uh, poor attitude at the treatment centers that uh, my heart breaks when I see them. When I have seen it happening before coming here, I used to see this happen in the treatment centers. These, these busy treatment centers, and just to give you an example, which I shouldn't, but for the understanding of the participants, a lab person which would, would, would yell from the end of the corridor and, you know, if I'm a TG, Arshad, you are HIV positive. Imagine the impact of that, you know. Imagine the impact of that. Or calling the TG with, with you know, with demeaning attitude towards them. It's unfortunate, unfortunate. Uh, but I must say that uh, in the past five years, two, three years, the Supreme Court took the case and now TGs can officially have a gender in the national identity. Uh, so yes, so there is some silver lining as well. Thank you. We all want some silver linings here. Uh, we did talk about innovations uh, in Philippines uh, using dating apps. Um, yeah. uh, and uh, I, I wonder from both of you, maybe start yeah. with uh, Dr. Kate, of course, you also talk about self-testing. There was a question that if CHWs could be uh, trained to use the telemedicine platform in Philippines, and of course, a similar question to also for Pakistan, like uh, will that be feasible for uh, Pakistan too? Uh, maybe uh, we take Dr. Kate's answer first and then Dr. Asha. Yes, I think that's a great idea. We're actually looking into uh, doing ARV initiation through the help of our community health workers doing same day testing and same day treatment via telemedicine. So it's not yet being done, but because we are approaching, um, we, we are, we, same day testing is now being um, uh, introduced to us. Uh, lifting the barriers to that through having all uh, ART initiation done at the facilities will be of massive help because if we limit it to only facility-based um, ART initiations, then we might not see the numbers that we desire. But if we empower our 
community um, health workers to use telehealth, uh, meet the patient where they are at, and then use, use it to, to actually um, facilitate same-day treatment, that would be great. Dr. Alta? So yes, uh, before coming to Egypt, I had led two studies of HIV self-testing among MSM and TGs in Pakistan. Two different approaches were used to, to assess the acceptability and feasibility. Among TGs, we, approach, we used uh, the outreach worker model in which the outreach workers, uh, because they go out routinely in the field, they went out in the field and used uh, their routine outreach to uh, advocate about HIV self-testing. Very encouraging result. Small sample size, 150, everybody agreed, and uh, the limited difficulty in using the self-testing. So uh, this model was uh, very much acceptable to the TGs and uh, it was successful. Among MSM, we tried a different approach in, uh, in an urban center, Karachi. And uh, what we did was used a different kind of uh, dissemination model, which was basically Facebook Messenger based, followed by uh, WhatsApp. So, uh, and we learned this kid from uh, Love Yourself. Uh, so yes, so this worked well and uh, uh, very effective. So, uh, I mean, we have a long way to go because in Kate's country, this organization has done great work in terms of using the technology, not only outreach, but they have a proper chatbot which answers questions and et cetera, et cetera. So we, do, we are not there yet, but uh, Facebook Messenger was used to, out, to reach out to MSM. They agreed, uh, initially Facebook, then WhatsApp, and uh, it worked well. So both approaches uh, uh, worked well. We are working on developing a manuscript on it. And uh, then uh, we will recommend this uh, to the key stakeholders in Pakistan, uh, so this will be the pathway for introducing of uh, HIV self-testing, which is which is the new world, which is the way to go about in terms of increasing the yield of HIV testing around the world. Thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to ask uh, one last question, like what call of action will you have towards the global health community? I mean, of course, with COVID, all the resources being diverted and uh, uh, we have made so much improvement in the last years and then everything kind of going down the drains. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, separately asking you, Dr. Kate first and Dr. Arshad, like, what do you think our messages should be? Uh, our message, uh, my call to action would be do not, um, not ignore the non-COVID diseases, um, even, only, even not focus only on infectious diseases, but also we, we're, we're all, also neglecting our non-communicable diseases. So we're seeing a lot of issues with other diseases. So it really calls for a strategy to make sure that there is equity and that all health uh, concerns are addressed uh, despite facing this um, large pandemic that we have. I know it's a struggle, but uh, like what was mentioned earlier at the start of this session, let's not let all the gains that we've um, gotten get unraveled because of the pandemic. Dr. Alta. Yes, uh, unfortunately, it's a different thing in Pakistan. The global community needs to jump start the advocacy angle with the government, unfortunately, and go back to the model of early 2000, mid 2000, then a blitz of advocacy was conducted. Pakistan, like Philippines had made gains and most of it is lost. So a jump start of an advocacy blitz is required that the epidemic is rising, low risk population are getting infected. It is trickling down to the bridging population, et cetera. And we need to increase the yield of uh, HIV testing among PLHIVs uh, so that you know they can be put on ARTs and et cetera, et cetera. So action item is advocacy. Uh, action two is uh, better sharing of data. Thank you both. Of course, uh, the data does not lie. We see that the impact of COVID-19 is huge. Of course, uh, already overwhelmed health facilities, already overwhelmed government and uh, yeah the huge need of advocacy and huge need of awareness raising 
the stigma and uh, we need to work a lot on that. Uh, thank you both for attending this uh, session and uh, hopefully Dr. Altav, the silver lining will be there soon. <laughs> Thanks guys. Aditi. Thank you.